So guys, carpal tunnel syndrome and cubital tunnel syndrome, two conditions which are commonly misunderstood and confused. So in this video, let's highlight the key differences between the two. Let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So as we said, Carpal tunnel syndrome and cubital tunnel syndrome are commonly confused. So in this video, we're going to highlight the key differences between them, including the signs and symptoms and how they present differently. Of course, we'll touch upon management. But first of all, let's start by looking at the anatomy between these two conditions. So first of all, carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a compression of the median nerve in the anterior wrist. So the median nerve travels through a small area in the front of the wrist or the anterior wrist called the carpal tunnel. Now over the top of the carpal tunnel is a roof of sheath of soft tissue called the flexor retinaculum, which is there in order to protect the structures underneath it. However, when that tissue gets irritated, it can compress down on that median nerve, giving symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. So by contrast, cubital tunnel syndrome is an elbow-based condition. This is where the ulnar nerve runs through the cubital tunnel where it gets compressed. Now the cubital tunnel is located on the medial side of the elbow here, between the medial epicondyle of the humerus, a clear bony ridge that you can feel on the medial elbow, and the olecranon, that bony point at the posterior part of the elbow. So as you can imagine, when the ulnar nerve gets compressed in that region, it can give off nerve signals into the forearm and the hand. So what causes these two conditions? Well, actually the causes can be quite similar between the two. For example, mechanical overload or overuse is probably the most common one, whereby irritation of the soft tissues around those nerves mean that you can get compression on the area. We might think about osteoarthritis, where as bony spurs and extra bony growth develops around the nerve, it can cause compression. Trauma, if you have an irritation to the nerve via trauma. We think about synovial hypertrophy, so enlargement of some of those synovial tissues in conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. And another really common one is pregnancy, particularly for carpal tunnel syndrome, whereby swelling of the soft tissues around the two nerves can cause compression and therefore symptoms. So next, what kind of symptoms are we expecting our patients to present with? Let's break this down logically between the two in terms of activities, in terms of pain and sensory changes, and in terms of motor changes too. So first of all, carpal tunnel syndrome. So the kind of activities we expect to irritate this condition are ones that are going to involve a lot of wrist flexion. That's going to compress that median nerve in the anterior wrist. So look out for your patient doing flexion-based activities or perhaps gripping-based activities of the wrist that aggravates their symptoms. Pain and sensory issues. So the median nerve primarily supplies the thumb, the second, the third, and the lateral half of the fourth digit of the hand. So these are the kind of areas that we're expecting our patient to present with pain, pins and needles, or perhaps numbness. Now, if we think about motor changes, some of the key muscles innervated by the median nerve in the hand include the first and second lumbricals, opponens pollicis, so doing this opposition movement of the thumb, abductor pollicis brevis, so again, abduction of the thumb, and finally, flexor pollicis brevis, so flexion of the thumb. So you're looking out for weakness of those particular muscles, and you might also see wasting of the thena eminence on the thumb side of the hand as well in the most severe cases. So with cubital tunnel syndrome, remember we said that this is based on an ulnar nerve compression at the elbow. So the kind of activities we might be thinking of relate to elbow flexion, which therefore compress that medial side of the elbow and therefore the ulnar nerve. Pain and sensory issues. We're thinking about the medial elbow itself, but then the ulnar nerve then goes on to innervate the ulnar side or the medial side of the forearm, as well as the fourth and fifth digit. So that's where we might expect pain to travel down or pins and needles and numbness to travel down as well. Then when we think about motor issues, the main kind of muscles that we're thinking about that might be affected might be, for example, flexor carpi ulnaris or flexor digitorum profunda. So we're thinking about flexion of those fourth and fifth digits. And sometimes in worst case scenarios, do look out for wasting of the hypothena eminence on the medial side of the hand, but there can be some crossover into the thena eminence as well. Once again, if you get motor weakness for either carpal or cubital tunnel syndrome, that's a sign of a severe compression and it needs to be acted on immediately. 
So next, objective tests. How can these help us diagnose these conditions? Well, first of all, probably the most simple one is gonna be Tinel's test at either the carpal tunnel or the cubital tunnel. So Tinel's test is basically where we do repeated tapping for 30 to 60 seconds on the actual nerve itself. So either the anterior wrist for the median nerve or at the cubital tunnel for the ulnar nerve, and we're tapping to see if it recreates our patient's symptoms. Now, if you're thinking about some other specific tests for carpal tunnel syndrome, we can think about Durkin's test. This is where the examiner places both thumbs against the median nerve at the anterior wrist, holding for about 30 seconds to see if it reproduces the patient's symptoms. And we can also think about Phelan's test. This is where the patient positions their back of their hands against each other like so, lifts the hands up whilst keeping the back of the hands together, and we see if it compresses the median nerve sufficiently to reproduce their symptoms. Now with cubital tunnel, we commonly use Tunnell's test, but we can also think about the active flexion test. This is where the patient actively will flex their elbow for between 30 to 60 seconds before looking to see if it reproduces our patient's symptoms. Now, as we said, wasting with cubital tunnel is a major sign of problems, and therefore we can look out for things like Wartenberg sign, the ulnar claw, or Fromont sign to see if our patient is symptomatic. Now, if you want to know more about those different tests, we've got a brilliant video in the description below so you can check them all out. Okay, so on to management. So starting with carpal tunnel syndrome, activity modification is really, really key. Here we think about trying to reduce the amount of repetitive wrist flexion that our patient is doing, and we can try and help promote that by either advising them to keep their wrist in more of a neutral position for different activities, using their other hand to see if they can take the pressure off the sensitive one. But another really brilliant way to help is using a wrist splint. So the idea with a wrist splint is that it aims to keep the wrist in more of a neutral position during day-to-day -day tasks, and therefore reduces the amount of wrist flexion that can then aggravate that median nerve. This is commonly also used at night for patients who get carpal tunnel syndrome at night, and it can be really successful for patients who have pregnancy-related carpal tunnel syndrome as well. So if those conservative measures are unsuccessful, there are more invasive procedures that can be used, such as a steroid injection and also a carpal tunnel release surgery, where basically a surgeon will go in and release that flexor retinaculum so in order to decompress that median nerve at the carpal tunnel. Now, there's evidence from Louis Erpen Blazar from 2012 that shows that this can have success rate between 75 and 90% and is a really common procedure used if those original measures don't add up. So what about cubital tunnel syndrome? Well, unfortunately, the evidence isn't so extensive to tell us all the key things that can be done, but we will naturally think about similarities to carpal tunnel syndrome, activity modification, getting them to use that elbow less, perhaps focus on the other side if they possibly can. We think about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to see if we can settle down any soft tissue irritation around the area. And sometimes you can get elbow splints to effectively prevent excessive flexion of the elbow as well. Now, I have to say from my own experience, I haven't found exercises to be that useful for patients with cubital tunnel syndrome, but we do know from evidence from Bultman and Hoffman that a similar decompression surgery around the elbow can be really effective with up to 98% success rate as dictated from their research. So once again, this is a really common procedure used for these patients if the natural conservative measures haven't done the trick. So guys, I really hope this video has helped you. If it has, please support us by smashing that like button, subscribe to our channel for more updates. And of course, we've got many more resources on Instagram at Clinical Physio and on our website, clinicalphysio.com. I'm Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.